Monster Hearts 2 is a teenage monster horror RPG written by Avery Alder and published in 2017. It's a revised version of the same game from 2012. The game focuses on high schoolers with deep interpersonal drama and who also harbor the secret of being a monster that sometimes reveals itself. It's a Powered by the Apocalypse game, so the game is narrative focused and based on so-called moves. The author lists a number of inspirations, but I have to tell you, to me it seems almost entirely like a Buffy the Vampire Slayer RPG, and if you haven't seen that show, I envy you because now you get to watch it in its entirety for the first time. Into the Dusk World is a Kickstarter project launching on December 14th. It's a dreamlike horror RPG in which you play as kids between age 9 and 12 who enter a sort of parallel world invisible to adults. Players enter this dream realm, where they cannot die but can be harmed. The game uses the tricolor system, an interesting take on step dice along with four core stats. There are also 14 abilities that your kid can tap into when trying to defeat the darkness. There is a free 80 page quick start guide for Into the Dusk World, complete with four pre-generated characters and an extensive sample adventure to dive into. The Kickstarter launches on December 14th. Get on their mailing list to be notified, I'll put the links to everything below. Arknight made their name with flat plastic minis, but the next step in their evolution of products is ultra detailed resin prints. You're probably familiar with at home resin printing by now, but if you don't want to deal with the messy process of printing them yourself, you can bolster your minis collection with Arknight's first collection of 3D models called D&D Classics 1. Included are six iconic monsters, they are printed solid and have an appreciable heft in the hand. All are mounted on a nice thick clear acrylic base so you have a better view of terrain underneath or any status tokens you might be using. Now, painting these things up is still on you. A lot of these Powered by the Apocalypse games list an agenda for the MC to follow, and it's actually a good starting place to get a feel for what kind of game it is. In Monster Hearts, there are four items it listed in the agenda, but really the first two here are the unique ones worth noting. This game is about teenage monsters embroiled in psychodrama, sex, and violence, and it's up to the MC to keep the heat on. Every scene is supposed to be filled with gossip, relationship discussions, nerves frayed and tempers flaring, almost constant manipulation, and worse if your table will allow it. And at the worst possible time, each character's darkest self emerges, their true inner monster. It manifests as malevolence or violence, and the players may or may not seek to turn the release valve to stop the outburst. So here's how it actually works at the table. Every game is a conversation, and when players say that their characters do certain actions, it triggers a move. With any move, you're rolling 2d6 and adding any bonus that you have from one of your core stats, hot, cold, volatile, or dark. If the sum of the dice and your bonus is 6 or less, you fail. A 7, 8, or 9 gives you a partial success as described by the move, and a 10 up is a complete success also described by the move. I'm not going to unpack each of the moves in this game, but I do need to discuss that first move, turn someone on. If it seems like a very sexual thing, that's because it is. Furthermore, it's not confined in any way by the gender or non-gender or sexual preference of the characters. So in other words, in Monster Hearts, your character could be suddenly attracted to anyone with a mere dice roll. It's worth noting that you do also have the option of making your character asexual, and that's just opting out of participating in this move whenever they want. The author explains that fluid sexuality is a big part of the game, but that not every character would be sexual, at least not all the time. Strings in the game are these things that you can have on another character. If you have a string on someone, you can spend it to do one of four things. You don't really keep track of who has strings on you, that would be too much bookkeeping. You keep track of who you have strings on and spend them at any time to manipulate or harm them. It bears repeating, strings are a major resource in this game and you're constantly gaining them and pulling them on people. Taking damage or harm in this game is ultra simple. You can take up to four harm. You can pick up more than one harm in a single incident. Once you get to four, you roll the skirting death move and you either succeed or you die. You can remove one harm per game session or two if someone is trying to help you heal. Interestingly, in the fiction, the person trying to help you also needs to tend to any emotional and psychological trauma that is associated with your physical injuries. Conditions take the form of gossip, unsavory opinions, and interpersonal labels. There are a few ways to pick up conditions, such as through the shutting someone down and pulling strings moves. 
and there's no predefined list of conditions. It's just any horrible, gossipy, drama-laden label or status that fits the situation, and it doesn't have to actually be true in the fiction. Other characters can take advantage of someone's condition if it fits a move they're making, and they get a plus one to their roll if it fits the moment. Every time a player fails a roll, their character gets a point of experience. After five points, they can buy an advancement for their character. These advancements are largely the same across all the character types or skins, but each skin also has one unique thematic advancement. There's also a concept called a season advance, where everyone at the table makes some huge changes to their character. The idea, of course, is that the story you're telling is like a television series, and when one season ends, the characters change and emerge in the new season premiere a bit different and fresh. This sort of gives permission to the players to keep things novel and exciting in their collective story. The most interesting season advances to me are the growing up moves. These all sort of have a positive palliative vibe to them and for the most part counters the antagonistic and manipulative motifs of the basic and special moves. And it really sort of tracks how characters in a long running teenage TV drama might start becoming more adult-like and empathetic as the seasons wear on. Monster Hearts has a lot of mechanical variation with each of the skins. Each has their own resource or other conceit to be tracked or concerned about. The ghoul, for example, has to deal with a visceral hunger that empowers them but drives them to pursue either fear, power, plunder, or thrills. The infernal owes a dark debt to a demonic entity and is always feeding it to stay one step ahead. Each skin has six to eight or more unique moves that sort of guide and push the player towards role-playing that particular type of character. The reward for successful moves is usually either strings on other characters or experience points, but can just be straight up superpowers like flying or connecting telepathically to your gang. It's not a secret that each of these skins is a metaphor for the trials and tribulations of adolescence, but really they're both a metaphor and sometimes just literally monsters with supernatural powers. And that right there is the foundation of Monster Hearts. You're dealing with a coming of age drama through the analogy of a campy horror TV show. This game dedicates pages and pages to safety and consent, but it's the first time that I actually felt the discussion on safety was truly needed. And importantly, it was the first time I felt that the subject was written about really inclusively and compellingly. The theme of characters in this game having sex with each other is so strong that each skin actually has a sex move that affords mechanical advantages and disadvantages to the character. And if you add the turn someone on role, where your character's sexual preference is suddenly less than certain, you're getting into some deep water, especially if you're playing with your cisgender grognard buddies. Monster Hearts declares itself to be a queer game with queer content, but it does so with extreme care and consideration for folks who might not be completely read into the invisible lines of empathy that are already well cultivated among some groups. The author describes three circles of responsibility when playing. The first is for yourself, as in look out for yourself. The second is for those who you're gaming with and who are watching the game. And the third is for those who you're portraying. I'll just leave it at that because I think it's so perfectly stated. But obviously the book goes into more detail on this concept. The principles listed in the MC section of this book sum up the intention of the game even better than the agenda I mentioned earlier. Some of these items are common to most PBTA games, but a few stick out as relevant to Monster Hearts. An MC who can keep these principles in mind would be able to run a teen monster drama of epic proportions, to say the least. The book encourages the MC to create the first front rows of a high school homeroom seating chart and to put each of the players in that chart and pack the rest with NPCs. Then the idea is to ask the players questions about their connections to these other NPCs and their reputations at school. The more dramatic the better, so that in the end the game is starting off with a messy, tangled, dense web of social drama. The book also comes with eight one-page story setting hooks called small towns. They each describe a, well, small town as well as some domestic or supernatural entity or group that has been causing problems. Also included are some suggested scene locations and suggested skins to use. This small town motif is definitely in line with a lot of teen TV and movie dramas, but you can set monster hearts in any time or location without any harm to the mechanics. One thing that you may lose if you set your game too far in the past is texting. This game encourages players to use the conceit of instant, immediate text messaging between characters not only to communicate but to harm and manipulate each other. You know, just like in real high school. Okay, so here are my thoughts on Monster Hearts 2. Cons. Sensitive subject matter. 
Not everyone's going to want to re-experience the drama part of their teen years, that's a given, but also with all the sex moves and sexual preference fluidity, this could put a lot of the less mature as well as the more traditional gamers in a really uncomfortable place. But who knows, maybe they could learn something about themselves in the process. Lack of art. There are some very understandable reasons why a game wouldn't be chock full of cool art. I know firsthand how taxing it can be to try and source and finance art, but the writing and game design in Monster Hearts is just so good, it just seems like a travesty that it isn't a full color book with provocative gothic illustrations on every page. Darkest selves are uneven. When worse comes to worst in a scene, a character reverts to their darkest self. For a skin like the werewolf, this just means straight up transforming into a werewolf. It could happen right in the middle of class or in the lunchroom, and that's awesome because this is a teen monster game after all. But a number of the skins have darkest self descriptions that are more slow burn and long term behavioral changes. It just would have been nice to see punchy, dramatic transformations for all the skins. Pros. This is the true Buffy RPG. I said it in the intro, this game seems to track a lot of the themes and motifs of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. The teen angst, the supernatural stuff everywhere, the campiness, the small towns. Full disclosure, there is an official Buffy RPG published by Eden Studios in 2004, and I have not read it. I asked Avery about this, and she said that there were actually some more direct inspirations for the game. Namely, Twilight, Ginger Snaps, The Vampire Diaries, The Craft, and The Lost Boys. So if you're a fan of any of those, you're in for a real treat with Monster Hearts. The Mechanics I now consider myself a student of Apocalypse Engine games, and that means in part, analyzing how a game's moves interact with each other and with the other resource pools in the game. Monster Hearts is like a Celtic knot. Everything interlocks beautifully. In fact, at the end of the book, the author thoroughly explains how removing a single move or resource pool when trying to tweak the game can make sweeping changes to how the game works. Safety. As I mentioned earlier, I've never seen such a well-written discussion of safety in gaming. There are many ways to approach safety, with gaming veterans telling me that they use anything from common sense to simplified contracts to the named tools that we all hear about now over and over. But the author here just sort of sells me on the concept by discussing empathy for others in terms that resonate with me. Something that hasn't happened for me with the other safety sections that are included in practically every game now. Avery told me that some of her insight actually came from a response to her first version of Monster Hearts, and I'll link that article below, as well as the origins of the X card that she also mentioned. Monster Hearts has served as inspiration for a ton of games in the PBTA space since its publication, and for good reason. It's concisely written, it's exquisitely designed, and it contains a lot of discussion of itself. And what I mean by that is that the author casually explains the heart and soul of the game, clearly demonstrating her years of playtesting and introspection. I'd wager that with a bit of tinkering, you could convert Monster Hearts into a pure teenage drama simulator by surgically removing the monster stuff, but that would mean removing the supernatural elements that make each character powerful and truly chaotic, and that wouldn't be nearly as much fun. As always, thanks for tuning in. This is Dave signing off. See ya.